By accident, because of the people I knew, <laughs> they went down Shagaramas, which was the, the, the club before the rock, which was a lesbian club. And we could, oh, Friday nights they had bands. And uh, so we could get in, you know, like if you didn't look too, too rough or you look rough enough, you get down there. And um, so I was going down there and it was great. They, um, I think it was um, White Stripe. They serve White Stripe beer in cans, which you could only get in Brixton because of the Jamaican, it's a Jamaican beer. And, uh, but that, they, they served it there. So it became one of my my favourite bars and then we hadn't been there for a couple of months and suddenly we turned up and it was turned into the Roxy and I was at the bar and like chatting people were saying yeah there's bands on every night now you know and um, and it was well what the lesbian were called a straight bar but um, yeah it turned into the Roxy and um, and then I was saying to my band we were still playing rock and roll uh, and I said, you, you've got to come down here. This is the future of rock and roll. And when they eventually, they were school kids. You know, I was 30. They were teenagers in college. You know. and, um, and when they did come in, they decided to be a punk band just like that. And I wasn't invited. <laughs> It was quick, um, actually, because um, we, we had kind of friends in other bands, and Chel um, the guitarist in Chelsea was a good friend of ours. And uh, you know, there was a there was a pub on the King's Road where just the punks met, and um, they had a punk jukebox and or rock and roll jukebox, and you know, all that old stuff. And um, and I was sitting there with um, James 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 Stevenson, is it? I think, and um, and then the rest of Chelsea come in with um, Miles Copeland, I think, was my manager, and I asked him if um, we could support, and um, and I think Miles said, I, I think we pass on that one, Charlie, <laughs> and within a couple of months, yeah, we we had our CI, we made CID, it was number one in the indie charts, and um, yeah, we were off, and they were begging us for it support. <laughs> The first record company we called took us on. We didn't want any money for it or anything, just get it out there. We got the guy from City Records in Kingston and then we are walking down the road after having a beer and he said, look, how about colour vinyl? And we go, yeah, love it. You know, we didn't think, you know, because um, he was a record dealer, this guy. And um, so he knew the little tricks. So, you know, I said blue, someone said red, someone said yellow, someone said green. And he said, right, we'll have, um, we'll have it out in four colours. And of course, all the collectors wanted it every colour. And most of the kids wanted a, a colour one to keep and a black one to play. And it got to number one in the indie charts. So, um, you know, from then on, we were in, from that, we got a, um, a deal uh, with a small company to do the first album and it all took off very quickly. Lovely, yeah. Yesterday, I was there. No, I'm writing my book and I was there in the south of France. So and the, the yeah, of yeah, France. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's funny, yeah, yeah, and they're great old days. Yeah, and I was writing about, um, I, I took me, on one, one occasion, or I think the third time I went down there, I took me, um, my ex-wife who used to have bottle for me um, up in Soho, so she was bottle, bottling for me there, and I was telling her about South of France, you know, it's really, really good and sunny, and, and she was a bit of a swimmer, she, she liked that, so I was telling her about the, because um, she nearly drowned in Brighton. You know, because you know the tide swept her out and, and dangerous, so she didn't want to go in the sea in England. So I was telling her about the Mediterranean. It's hardly got a tide, you know, and uh, even I can swim out there. And um, so um, yeah, we went down. All the great busters went to Nice and done the cafes, and they're like, 
they'd do a few tunes and pass a hat round, you know, but um, I wasn't so great, so I'd go on the promenade at Nice. And of course, all the French have their holidays all at the one time, all on the kind of hot two weeks in August or July, isn't it? So you're on the promenade above the beach, just um, strumming away, thousands and thousands. And in them days, you know, like Bob Dylan, uh, um, Donovan, you know, all these people, even the busker called um, Tom Partridge, I think his name was, and, you know, uh, and all these people, you know, acoustic people in the hit parade. So a lot of people actually loved it. So, um, yeah, we do well, but not enough, alas, to get a hotel room because, say, the prices were sky high, you know, for that, just for that weekend, week. Can you remember mm. the songs you were playing? Um, when I used to play in London, I, um, I used to play in the tunnels, nice echo kind of thing, chamber, and a train would come up. Every couple of minutes, a train and about 100 people would cut past by. And I, and I got it down to a couple of happy songs, um, San Francisco Bay Blues, you know that one? I don't. Yeah. yeah. I'll go to the and um, uh, a, a song called Bottle of Wine, which is kind of, kind of a traditional folk song. Bottle of wine, fruit of the vine. When you're gonna let me get sober? Leave me alone. Let me go home. Let me go back and start over. And um, it's a happy song. And um, yeah, that earn a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he did in a way. I mean, what happened was um, he used to play harmonica for the five dimensions. Okay. Not the fifth dimension, the five dimensions, I think, that they, they were called. And he just used to sit on a bar stool on stage and play harmonica. He, he wasn't... The lead singer was a um, great, great singer, but he had his, his voice was almost too good for R&B, where Rod had that kind of rough gravelly voice and uh, Rod Stewart used to get up, Rod the Mod as he was called back then, he used to um, do a couple of Jimmy Reed songs, Bright Lights, Big City, Shame, Shame, Shame and then play the harp, harp with them and um, and, it, and, I, and I thought like he was good, you know, I liked him better than the singer, although the singer was a great singer really, but uh, anyway, um, so Rod Stewart I found that he was good friends with a couple of my busking friends and another guy called Blues Jim. And um, so, you know, we were in, a, it was Ken Collier's Jazz Club, which was called Studio 51 on R&B nights. And, um, you know, and he was in the crowd just talking to us. And, I, and I, you know, I was kind of saying, I love your guitar, your, your harmonica playing. So like, you know, because I just, played a, a rack, you know, just a folksy rack. And um, you know, I said, how do you play that blues stuff? You know, like, and then he, he told me and um, showed me what to do. It's quite simple, really. Instead of blowing, you suck. <laughs> so do you kind of get sharper notes? So anyway, um, yeah, he showed me what to do. And we were, you know, he kind of blowed a few phrases and I tried to follow him, you know. Like, and this is in a... Um, in the middle of a crowded club, you know, with music going, not not the band, but the, in an interview and you know, music still going. And, uh, yeah, it was just like, you know, you see him in a pub everywhere, you know, like Rod the Mod, he was, uh, you know, the big face in London. I like to think so. <laughs> so um, I don't have to go on long walks with my wife. <laughs> so, no, I've done my work. Um, yeah, it, it is. And yeah, it's, it's kept me as fit as, you know, um, can be to do it. I, I don't jump around as much as um, I used to because, um, especially with COVID, you know, like I'm a bit breathless. I'm breathless if I tie me, put my shoes on and tie my laces. Yeah, twice. twice. Yeah, yeah. The well, the first, the first, yeah, the first, first time there was no what's the name, and I was ill for um, ten months almost. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was locked in for a year. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, was, I was writing my book, so that was quite useful. One, two, two, two. The publisher's an American publisher in L.A., and they're just waiting for me to finish. And I've basically finished it. I'm just going through correcting, making things a little bit brighter and, you know, starting, you know, like starting a line with a punch and ending with a something, you know, where people go, oh, you know. I was born in the war when the bombs were dropping. And so I got my mums and aunties all horror stories kind of thing in the beginning. Me and the missus were talking about that yesterday, um, looking forward to the book tour. Because, um, you know, I, I go, go off on these little um, solo jaunts and we, we have so much fun. It's, it's you know, the subs is a kind of, um, you know, it's almost like a rock, punk rock church. You know, everyone's a bit serious and, you know, dedicated. And um, But my little thing is a, is that quite life-hearted and um, you know the people who come there are just amazing it's like the subs the subs um, fans are I love them they're they're wonderful people and it's although like the guys who come to see see the acoustic one it's like the cream you know they're most of them are friends I don't know anyone, as you say, ha hasn't been shafted. You know, it's, uh, you know, Elton John, you know, the, the bigger they are, the more millions have been taken off them, you know, like... Uh, um, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of a cutthroat, you've got to... Um, you know, we've had a few, you know, people, uh, even, like, you know, friends, uh, and who have, like, taken us for a ride, yeah. Yeah, I kind of listened to the new stuff, new trends. Even almost before I was playing, I lived next door at a guitar shop. The guy had a studio upstairs, and we used to talk about music trends, you know, and I remember I've always been a bit interested in that, that side of it, you know. The band I love, a new band I love now, Amel and the Sniffers, I just love them. She's just got so much energy, she's like, you know, people talk about force of nature. She is brilliant. If you were a young pup, would you come back into the business would, if you started now? Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. You still think there's the excitement? Yeah, let me there. come back again <laughs> as a musician, not a dog. <laughs> <laughs> we're a bit more popular in America than we are in England. Yeah, a little bit. The level goes up, and and or, or numbers go up a bit. And like we're playing London here to about I don't know five seven hundred people. If we play a bigger place, or um, the hundred club only holds like three or four hundred. So, but if you play uh, in in you know the big place like L.A. or something, it's thousands. Yeah, and the same as in Europe. You know, in Europe. Um, you know, you get a thousand people in, uh, in in Hamburg and a thousand people in Berlin, and you know it, go, it goes right up. No, that's all right. Just put it on the wrong way somehow. In Bermondsey, there was a kind of um, you know, it's got a reputation of having like boxing gyms and stuff, and international boxers came down and. One guy used to come down called John Conte. He's a, he's a world middleweight champion, you know, in Liverpudlian. And here come here come to the bar. <laughs> and someone will come up to me and go, um, John would like to sing a song with you. And, yeah, and, I, and I said, um, that's okay, you know, that's okay, you know, you can't refuse. You know, everyone knew he was a world champion, you know, as soon as he got on chase, there was a big cheer, you know. 
And, so, and he always used to sing, you know, this happened a few times, this used to sing um, When the Saints Go Marching In. Now, it, it is a bit of a cornball song, and we could play it with our eyes shut, you know, as a regular 12 bar. And, um, but he got on stage, and if you can imagine 300 people singing back at him when they, in the chorus, um, you know, it was like a big kind of church choir kind of thing. It was brilliant. You know, the atmosphere was absolutely brilliant. And you can't beat that kind of thing, you know. The, and it is about, you know, like people are accessible and, you know, they can be heard, can yell out, <laughs> you know, like, get on with it or whatever, you know. And that's a, there was one downer about that because he, he had a brother called Fred. And Fred used to want to come on stage, and he was a rotten singer. You know, John Conte was good, but uh, Fred wasn't so good. And um, he wanted to do My Way by, by Frank Sinatra, and we didn't know that one. You know, <laughs> we were struggling with that one, but the piano player was all right. Didn't it? So the piano player done a big ending, you know, like... Uh, and it, it was all good, and this is like the fun of the pub. It's brilliant. Both really, because I like the raw, the kind of raw Chicago kind of stuff, and then Robert Johnson, you know, just the kind of nice raw stuff. And um, and punk remind, you know, punk was a return to that, you know, no frills, just the, you know, just the bones, you know. You know, after COVID, we just want to work. Um, April, you know, we, we start and we don't stop, so we're all ready, you know, raring to go, yeah. Brilliant stuff. Right, let me take a quick photo. I don't want a posterity. No. Uh, there's a portrait one here. I've got a portrait on here, so I don't know what this is. I've never used this before. Charlie, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Yeah, you, you, you're really very, you know... You know, you're, you're very good because um, the best kind of um, interviews are you just have a chat, you know.